Uh, I've uh, entitled this final uh, message for Sunday morning, Fulfilling the Ultimate Goal of Christ. What is it that the church is about that we should fulfill in the timing and purposes of the Lord? Let's have a look at Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Here in God gives us a picture of what his ultimate purpose is. Let's have a word of prayer just at this moment and ask God through his Holy Spirit to seal his word to our hearts and to lead us into all the truth that he wants us to understand today. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the wonderful ultimate goal that you have set for us, that you have not given us an impossible task. By the power of the Holy Spirit, your purposes are going to be fulfilled. God is working his purpose out from year to year. And the day will come when these beautiful prophetic passages will come true. And we will see your kingdom come, even as we pray every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, teach us this day by your Holy Spirit. Lead us into an understanding of your truth that we may obey you in all things. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to look at the passage here for a moment uh, to consider what are some of the important things that we see here. What is our ultimate purpose? What is our destiny? Well, we see right at the start, that our destiny is worship. Uh, what is the chief end of man? Uh, one catechism asks. And the answer is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And here we get a glimpse of what the heavenly worship is like. What it is like for the work on earth to be done and the saints to be gathered into the kingdom of God for ever and ever, all eternity to spend with the Lord. And uh, they sing, and they pour out incense, and they uh, lift up the Lord, and they fall down before the Lamb. They do all the various aspects of worship that you can imagine, from prayer to personal uh, prostration before the Lord. Uh, and interestingly enough, they not only sing, they sing a new song, a wonderful song, one that will be something that sums up all that God has done in his church. And what do they sing? Well, they're singing praise to the Lamb of God, who is the one who's able to open the seals and to reveal the end times and to bring in the kingdom of God and its consummation in the new Jerusalem. And what do they sing to Jesus? Well, they sing of his worthiness, but they also sing of what he has done. You have redeemed us to God by your blood, the blood of the cross, the cross which is the central point of human history, the central point of our belief that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, suffering on the cross the punishment for our sins and setting us free to be able to know God, to love God, and to love each other. But notice who it is that is redeemed by this great understanding. You have redeemed to God people out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. That is to say that the wonders of all the cultural diversity of our planet that God himself has created, we know even from Revelation chapter 11, by fiat he created all of this cultural diversity. And here it is brought to fruition when all of the nations gather together to worship God, to give him the praise. Uh, to uh, use whatever is beautiful in their culture, whether it be from, uh, uh, from singing, whether it be from beautiful things that people give, 
uh, everything that is beautiful in every culture. There will be a multitude of Chinese believers standing there. There will be a multitude of uh, Hispanic, uh, Spanish-speaking people uh, glorifying God there. I believe there will be a great multitude of Arabs who will be standing there worshiping and praising God. There will be a huge number uh, of Dravidians and Aryans from uh, North and South India. They will be there praising the Lord. There will be a multitude of peoples from uh, Russia, from North Russia, from Siberia, from European Russia. There will be peoples from all the earth, not just geographically, but culturally speaking, using their languages, using whatever is beautiful in their culture to glorify God. That's the ultimate goal. That's what we want to be about as Christians. Uh, that's what the focus of our lives need to be. Well, in order to illustrate that, I wanted to kind of show two key things about God and his purposes. One of them is to really illustrate for you that it is God who is at work, both to will and to do his good pleasure in you. So I'm going to tell you some stories that I hope illustrate something of the diversity of God's kingdom and also how God himself is at work. We think that we're called to work, and yes, we are. We have a calling. But ultimately, it's God's work, and it is God who is doing that work in and through us. So I'm going to share a screen here again, and uh, we're going to talk about another interesting uh, aspect of this. And I trust you can see this okay. Uh, let me make sure my screen is being saved here. Up here, it's not giving me my screen saver. Come on now, come on, let go. All right, go out of that. There's the screen saver. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, there we are. We're actually at the uh, one that I want to do, and I'm going to go back to, from the current slide. All right, let's take a look uh, for a moment at God's work in preparing the kingdom. I wanted to start by telling you a, a story about dreams and visions in Bangladesh. You know, I went as a missionary to Bangladesh in 1982, and I worked there until 1991 for about nine years. And uh, this particular event that I want to describe for you happened uh, about 1987. I had opened up a new church planting station in a little town called Kaliakor. And I had been um, going out to the tea shops, meeting people, inviting them back to my shop, having Bible studies. We had begun our mahofils, which are monthly meetings with inquirers to come together and to share the good news. Uh, sometimes those meetings would go all night as we shared the gospel and told people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And over time, we had seen uh, a small group of uh, individuals who had taken baptism and were interested in going on with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we really didn't have a leadership type person uh, at that point. And then a very remarkable thing happened. And I want to tell you that story in, in full screen. So we'll drop out of that just for a second. Very interesting thing happened. Uh, I was sitting in my little shop uh, with a group of five uh, Bangladeshi uh, either believers, new believers, or inquirers, and we were studying the Bible together. All of a sudden, there was a knock on the door, and uh, the door opened, and uh, a gentleman stepped in, someone probably in his mid-30s, and uh, he looked really excited and happy to see me, which made me a little nervous, because I'm thinking, okay, is this guy secret police? Uh, is he coming to check us out? Because I I didn't recognize him. I'd never met him. I had never shared anything with him. So in a Muslim society, you tend to be a little suspicious. Uh, and uh, he padded right down to the front where we were uh, sitting together. And uh, he squatted down in the floor because we didn't have chairs. We didn't have benches. We all just sat on the floor kind of in a, in a circle. He sat at one side of the circle, looked me square in the eye, and he said, what does Matthew one twenty one say? Well, this is not a question I get every day from a Muslim, so I'm a little curious. Why do you want to know? And he said, well, Jesus told me to ask you. Jesus told you to ask me. 
How did Jesus do that? And he went into this story. Now, the previous night had been uh, a night uh, in Bangladesh, which is called Shobhi Borat. Uh, it is supposedly the night of power, the night, uh, according to Muslim tradition, when the first chapter of the Quran was revealed to the prophet Muhammad. And because of that, it's considered a very auspicious night. Uh, one of the traditions typically followed throughout the Muslim world is that you try to stay up on this night and pray all night long. You don't sleep at all that night. Uh, many pious Muslims also fast on that night, and they just uh, plea with God. And the idea is that there's lots of brownie points, what they would call suab, that you can gain from God. If you're able to stay up all night in prayer, uh, and by the way, the prayer is formulaic. This is not conversational prayer. You're not talking to a God who is your friend. Um, God is not your friend. You don't know God. You don't experience God. You do not have a relationship with him. All you have is rules. You have laws. So follow the laws, and uh, maybe, just maybe, God will uh, come and visit you with his blessings. The idea being that if you can pray all night without falling asleep, on this particular night, it's like the merits of 10,000 nights of prayer. So 10,000 nights of special blessings that maybe will allow me to be accepted into heaven when I die. So very, very key auspicious night. But as with all Islamic blessing, there is a condition. Can't fall asleep. If you fall asleep, it's no soup for you. Uh, and uh, you, it, you, you've lost all, all that you would have wanted to gain. Well, uh, this gentleman, Sayyid was his name, uh, tried to pray all night. Unfortunately, though, his spirit was willing, his flesh was weak, and he fell asleep. Well, so much for the blessing. You know, you didn't fulfill the law, so you don't get the blessing. But as he slept, he had a dream. And in that dream, first, uh, he was sitting on the pathway outside of his little house uh, in Bangladesh, and he saw a man walking down the pathway towards his house. And he recognized the man immediately. It was his father. Now, his father had already died, had been dead for about six years. So this was quite an important event. In, in Bangladeshi dreams, if you see those who are predeceased, uh, in Islamic law, they have whole books on how you interpret dreams. And this is usually a very auspicious dream. And uh, the first thing that came into his mind was, since his father has passed on, he knows what the pathway is to get God's blessing. Maybe I should ask God, or I should ask him if he knows how I can know if God will accept me. So he ran to his father, and he knelt down on the ground, and he did what any good Bangladeshi will do when meeting uh, their father. Uh, he reached out his hands in a kneeling position, and he touched his father's feet. It's, it's called the pronam kora to show great respect to his father. And then he looked up into his father's eyes and he said, Father, Father, can you tell me the way of salvation? How can I know if God will accept my deeds? Now remember, in Islam, you get accepted by God through your deeds. But are they good enough? Have you done enough? Will God accept them? Uh, how much do you have to do? Uh, how do you know if he's accepted them or not? So he asked his father this wonderful question, how can I know if God will accept my deeds so that I might gain salvation? And his father said to him, I don't know, but talk to the one who's coming after me. And then his father vanished. Well, now he's quite astonished. Who's coming next? Well, after a few moments, another man appears on the pathway and uh, Said recognizes him as well, even though he had never seen him alive. Uh, this was a gentleman who died before he was born, but he recognized him from pictures that he'd seen. Uh, it was his grandfather. Now his grandfather was very recognizable because he was the first man in their village ever to go on the Hajj, on the pilgrimage to Mecca. That made him a very holy man. And it also enabled him to decorate himself in a very special way that only hajis are allowed to do. 
and that is he took red henna and he dyed his uh, you know flowing white beard red with henna uh, and that was a sign that he was a haji a person to be deeply respected so he was the most religious man in the village's history and so uh, Sahid thought to himself oh my goodness grandfather would know the answer to this question so once again he fell on his knees and he touched his grandfather's feet and he said grandfather grandfather tell me the way of salvation how can i know if god will accept my deeds and the grandfather also sadly shook his head and he said i don't know but talk to the one who comes after me and he too vanished now Said's really curious who's coming after grandfather who's who's more religious than grandfather who who would know the answer to this question well a third gentleman appeared on the pathway and once again Said ran to greet him now for some reason i don't know how this works but my muslim friends when they meet this guy in a dream they always recognize who he is it was hajat isamasi it was the lord jesus christ so once again he fell on his knees and he touched jesus's feet and he looked up into jesus's eyes and he said aisa aisa jesus jesus tell me the way of salvation how can i know if god will accept my deeds and jesus said to him i will show you the way of salvation but first you must go to the missionary in Kaliakor and ask him what Matthew 121 says. Now, mind you, Said had never seen a Bible. He had no idea what was in the Bible. Uh, he had no idea what Matthew means or what 121 means. All he knew is that somehow that thing that Jesus had told him about would give him the answer to his question. So uh, at that point, I opened the Bible for him. He says, so what does Matthew 121 say? I didn't have it memorized then. Uh, I do now, just in case this happens again. And uh, we open to Matthew 121, and, and it's the story of the angel coming to Joseph and saying to him about the one that is to be born by Mary, that you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And starting from that point, I explained to Said that all the good works in the world cannot save your soul. We are never good enough for God. We all, which is why we need grace. And God has provided a means for grace for us in Jesus, because he was the one who died for our sins, who paid the price of our sins on the cross. And therefore, when we believe in him and make him Lord in our lives, he washes us from all impurity. He takes away all of our sins. We are completely washed white as snow, much better than going on the Hajj, because it's Jesus himself who washes you. And uh, at that point, Said decided to follow Christ. And uh, one of the few Muslims I've ever met where I actually had the pleasure of leading him to Christ the very same day. Doesn't happen very often that way. Usually it takes more time, but God had prepared him. Now, I want you to see something here. What did I do right? Was I clever? Uh, was I someone who had uh, really arranged this in a really neat and, and excellent fashion? Actually, I had very little to do with this event. The only thing I did right was being where I was supposed to be. And God did the rest. And I think that's a beautiful analogy of this work that we are engaged in. We don't know how God has prepared someone. I can remember I was sharing the gospel some uh, years ago with a young woman at the Y, and uh, I didn't know what was going on in her life, but she was in a very difficult situation. She just started college, and uh, her dad had walked out on her mom. Uh, they'd gotten divorced, and the father had a new girlfriend. And uh, one day, the father uh, became upset with his daughter that she was not coming around and showing respect to his new girlfriend. And so he basically threatened her. He said, if you don't start respecting my girlfriend and, and calling her mom, um, I'm gonna cut you off. I'm not gonna pay for your college education. Pretty blunt. Now, as I'm sharing the gospel with this gal, I don't know what's going on in her life. 
I don't know the tragedies, the problems, the issues, the struggles, but in the midst of this trial that she's going through, this young woman is seeking for something to give her life meaning. And when I shared the message of the gospel, I asked her, would you like to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Now, she wasn't ready at that moment. She said, let me go home and, and think about it. This is how it often happens with me. I'm not an evangelist. You know, people don't want to pray with me. They want to do something else. And that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm one on the, on the pathway. Well, you know, that weekend just happened to be Easter weekend. And she grabbed her mom that Sunday and said, let's go to church. So they went to a church of a pastor I know very well. And uh, of course, on that morning, Easter Sunday morning, the pastor, of course, gave an altar call. And that gal and her mom went forward to receive Christ. The next Monday, when I came into the Y to do my usual exercise, who should be there at the head desk but this particular gal? And I can see 50 yards down the hallway as I'm coming that she's received Christ because she was just beaming. And, and I thought, wow, isn't it wonderful how God arranges things? It is God who is at work within you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. That's our excitement. That's a story I want you to um, imbibe and trust in your heart because as you step out in faith, believe me, God is preparing the way before you. Well, let's go on to another story. I, I kind of have three stories that I would like to tell you today. And um, the second one really deals with this whole subject of um, how do we deal with the reality of uh, suffering? How do we deal uh, with this area of suffering uh, in our lives? Uh, what is God doing in our circumstances as human beings? Uh, sometimes he's working through dreams and visions, as the story I just told you. Sometimes he works through suffering. And uh, let me just tell you one quick story from my own life. Um, I was doing a Christian conference up in a place called Baldipukur and uh, teaching the young men. Uh, an issue came up where I needed to drive out to a little village area to retrieve uh, a lost item from one of our vehicles. And on my way there, uh, through some mistakes, I ended up stopping at one village because we thought we were about to run out of diesel fuel. Other people went on to get the thing and I sat by myself in the car waiting for uh, these people to return. So we hopefully have enough diesel to get back to the conference area. Unbeknownst to me, that area had been um, robbed by robbers traveling around by vehicle. And uh, all of a sudden a riot broke out. I, I didn't know what was going on, but all of a sudden this mob of uh, Bangladeshis accosted the car and me, and they captured what they thought was a robber. Uh, Wow. Um, and in Bangladesh, when you catch a robber, you don't turn them over to the police because robbers have money. They just pay the poli police a bribe and, and they get let go. So when you catch a robber in Bangladesh, um, you kill him. And uh, that's what I was being subjected to. And in fact, you don't do it fast because it's kind of like reality TV entertainment. So you take your time. Uh, so I got beaten quite badly, got a spear through my arm, almost lost my left eye. I uh, went through some really rough things. Uh, in the meantime, my friends who had gone off to the other village figured out that I was in deep trouble. <laughs> and uh, they got a hold of a village headman, described to him what they'd heard was happening. And the village headman came up with a plan to extricate the foreigner uh, from this mob that was in the process of killing him. And in fact, they got to the place of doing a couple of mock executions with a, a kind of an ax called a, a, a ramdao that they were going to sort of split my skull with. Um, and they did a couple of, of fake swings to just see if they could, you know, in situations like that, what do you say? Um, God did say one thing to me. He just said, shut up. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. Uh, when you don't say anything, that actually confuses people. Saying stuff will get you into more trouble. Uh, but not saying anything actually bought me some time until these brothers could get into the situation and uh, the village headman came up with a ruse. He said, I'm going to declare I'm such and such a village headman, and I want to execute this guy at my house. So they managed to get me out of the mob 
And the mob followed us down to the guy's house, but at the house, it was the only house in the area that had electric lights. And it, this was a moonless night that was cloudy so that nobody could see my face. They were all running around with these little kerosene lanterns that didn't give any light at, light at all, wouldn't tell you, you know, what the skin color or anything was. Soon as they got me into the electric lights, it becomes obvious, oh, this guy's a foreigner. He's clearly not a Bangladeshi robber. And then suddenly everybody became my friend. And it's like, oh my goodness, who beat you up? And probably some of the people that beat me up were in the group saying, what happened to you? Anyway, um, interesting thing was police did arrive. Uh, when the police arrived, they got kind of consternated with me because I had decided I was going to forgive the villagers. This was simply an aspect of, you know, misunderstanding. They didn't know who I was. And uh, that's why the situation became like it did. Now that got me into trouble with the police because they wanted to have a case taken out against villagers. And if you got a case, then they can also get some bribes and that sort of thing. And I don't want to sound nasty that way, but you know, Bangladeshi police are not hardly paid anything. So this is kind of how you augment your income. I thought I was about to get beaten up for a second time, um, you know, for not taking out a case so that they could get these opportunities for bribes. But finally, after much consternation, I wrote them a letter in which I forgave the villagers and signed it and grudgingly they accepted it and then allowed me to go to the hospital because I was in fairly rough shape. So uh, they put me on the back of a motorcycle and uh, we headed off to um, the hospital. And as we were riding on our way to the hospital, I had the only vision that I've ever had of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I saw him standing before Pilate, and I saw him being beaten in brutal ways and being accused of all kinds of things that he had not done. And for the first time in my life, I had something of a sense of what that's like. Uh, I too had been beaten for no reason uh, when I wasn't guilty of any wrongdoing. Um, and then as I saw this scene in my mind's eye, suddenly three things struck me in rapid succession. The first was, if I could have avoided this situation, I would have done anything to avoid it. Jesus chose it. Second thing, I had a number of Bangladeshi friends who literally put their lives on the line to try to rescue me out of that situation, because going into a mob to rescue a robber is very dangerous. Nobody came to rescue Jesus. And then the third thing that struck me, he did that for me. He did that to rescue me. And I just wept. It was the most powerful experience of love and communion with the Lord Jesus Christ I'd ever had. And suddenly the worst thing that ever happened to me became the best thing, the best communion with the Lord. And you know, the amazing fallout from that was when the villagers found out that I had forgiven them, uh, I had the only opportunity of my entire career in Bangladesh to actually do public outdoor preaching to a group of about 500 villagers who came actually to apologize for what had happened. And it was a perfect opportunity to me, for me to use that analogy that this is what God did in Christ to redeem us, to forgive us from our sins. He took our sins on himself. And as a result of that, two local village fellowships got started in that area. And I came to understand, you know what? Uh, suffering is worth it if you know that it's going to bear fruit for the kingdom of God, that God's kingdom would be established. And friends, uh, as we think about fulfilling the command of Christ, uh, carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth, some of you, if you do that, you're going to go through some suffering. It's part of the ball game. And even for some, that may mean uh, not surviving. And I, I want to say this very, very gently, uh, but the fact of the matter is that I have friends uh, who have suffered and died for their testimony in Jesus. Um, two of these individuals, I did not know the first one, Mehdi Debaj, but I did know Haik Hovsepian. Uh, Haik was uh, a leader uh, in the church in Iran, and Mehdi was also a uh, uh, an Iranian believer who'd come from Muslim backgrounds. Haik was actually from uh, Armenian background, but Haik had a real calling and a love for uh, Muslims. And he had been sharing the gospel uh, with Muslims for 30, probably 40 years. When the Iranian revolution came along, 
uh, the government began to uh, capture, uh, kidnap different believers from Muslim backgrounds and put them to death. Uh, the man who actually pastored the church my wife served in in Shiraz, Pastor Sayah, uh, was murdered uh, in that way. Mehdi Debaj, who I did not know, but he worked uh, with Hike. Uh, he was kidnapped, uh, disappeared for a week, and then his body uh, was found on the street. Uh, Hike stayed on in his ministry, continued his work, even though word was coming back to them that they were eventually going to go after not just the Muslims who had converted to Christ, but all those who had worked with Muslims and helped them to come to Christ should also be uh, killed. And Hike was eventually uh, kidnapped by government agents. Uh, once again, he was beaten to death uh, and then left uh, on the street. And uh, his family and, and uh, believers all across Iran mourned uh, the passing of Haik Hosepian. So the church in Iran has been baptized in the blood of the martyrs. Uh, and then, if you recall from the story I told on Friday night, wow, God is doing a new thing in Iran. And we believe somewhere between 750,000 and a million Iranian Muslims have become followers of Jesus. Mehdi's blood, Haik's blood, became the seed of the church, the way in which the church of Jesus Christ has been established. Well, I have a final scripture passage I want to read for you just briefly. And I want you to think about this. Where will you stand on the day that Christ's kingdom comes in its power? If we look at uh, God's testimony to us, uh, will this be God's testimony concerning you, that you were prepared uh, to pay any price, to suffer any uh, problem, issue, even death, to take the message of Jesus to those who haven't heard? Consider this passage uh, from chapter 6 of Revelation, uh, beginning at verse 9. This is what it says. Now, when the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been violently killed because of the word of God, because of the testimony they had given. By the way, I have three friends who are going to be uh, in that special place. Uh, I know that uh, Mehdi Debaj will be there. I know that Haik Hovsepian will be there. I know that Pastor Saya will be there. And my good personal friend, John Tarswell, who was martyred by the Afghans back in 1989, uh, he will also be there. And they cried out with a loud voice, how long, sovereign master, holy and true, before you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? Each of them was given a long white robe, and they were told to rest for a little longer until the full number was reached of both their fellow servants and their brothers, who were going to be killed just as they had been. Wow. The measure of the martyrs of Jesus Christ has not been fulfilled yet. Uh, I know some of the people who will be in that special place, who will be given that long robe, who will be asked to wait just a little while longer. To what purpose? In order that those who are giving testimony to Jesus will give the fullest measure of their love. And some of them will do so by putting their lives on the line for Jesus. Well, I guess that's my question to us all. What does it mean to fulfill the command of Christ, to fulfill the ultimate goal of Christ? For some of us, this may even cost us our lives. And that's worth it. That is really worth it. By the way, having almost been beaten to death once, let me do tell you that when you get totally zonked on uh, yeah, hormones going crazy in your body when you're being beaten, you really don't feel a whole lot. Uh, it's not as bad as it sounds. Now, if you survive, the next day is mm, interesting. But let me say this. God gives grace for every circumstance. As Christians, we need to be totally sold out to Jesus ready to go anywhere at any time, bold through the Holy Spirit to share the name of Christ wherever we go, whether it's at the Y or at the local golf club or at your favorite market where you have some people that you know, or to the ends of the earth. 
And even in those places where believers are put to death for their testimony in Jesus, it's worth it to give your all for him. And so my final challenge to you is, are you prepared to give all to the Lord Jesus Christ? It's Sunday morning. This would be a great time for you to come forward before the Lord, whether where you're sitting, uh, if you're at home, under whatever circumstance, just bow the knee before the Lord and say, Father, from this point on, I belong to you. And you can have your way with me. I give you myself, my body, my soul, all that I am. God, work through me to fulfill the ultimate goal of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the tremendous challenge of what it means to follow Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that it's not impossible because your spirit gives grace for every circumstance. You empower us to be your servants, to be your testimony, and yes, even to be martyrs, as your Holy Spirit calls us. So, Father, be with your people today. Help them to remove every encumbrance, anything that causes them to stumble, that they may lay their lives on the altar of God as Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 tells us, to present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable to God. And not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. God, do this in your people this day, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.